This story has twists and turns, and to top it all off, it's a locked room mystery. So when Greg Flanagan returned to his hotel room one night, he began his favorite nightly routine that he always did when he was alone on business trips. He flopped on the bed, lit a cigarette, ate some Reese's candy, and turned on the movie Iron Man 2. But what Greg didn't know when he checked in was that he would never check out. One morning, Susie Flanagan called her husband Greg to ask how his business trip was going, but he didn't pick up. Now, this was Susie and Greg's usual tradition, to talk on the phone each morning when Greg was away on a business trip. So when Greg wasn't picking up around the time he was normally awake, Susie got nervous. Greg also didn't show up for work that day, so two of his coworkers went over to his hotel room to check on him. After they finally got the door open, they were met with something pretty dang shocking. Detective Apple got to the scene and checked things out, but he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary about the body. Investigators snapped a few pictures of the scene and then sent Greg off for an autopsy so they could figure out what the exact medical cause of his early checkout was. The only mark on the man's body that the examiner could see was a scrape on his cheek, which the examiner figured must have happened when Greg's face hit the rug. But then the examiner noticed a rather interesting injury. So the examiner began the autopsy and noticed that he was not looking at someone who expired from natural causes. At the front of Greg's torso, he saw an extensive amount of internal damage that didn't make sense at all. The coroner mentioned that he would usually see this kind of damage from a car accident or a person who's been beaten, so he begins to poke around more. And that's when he found two broken ribs and a hole in Greg's heart. At that point, the examiner believed that someone had attacked Greg and delivered a crushing blow to his chest that caused lethal damage. He also determined that the injury to Greg's groin was from someone kicking it hard. What started off as a simple call for Detective Apple was about to turn into one of the most confusing and mysterious cases of his entire career. After six months of chasing down every lead possible, Apple was stuck. At first, he assumed that Greg could have been beaten outside the room and then dropped back inside, but he kept getting hung up on Greg's injuries. The confusing thing is, the outside of Greg's body didn't show any signs of being battered, which is weird considering how much of his insides had been scrambled. Also, if the attack had occurred inside the room, there certainly weren't any signs of struggle, and no one nearby claimed to have heard anything. Weeks go by, and then months, and Apple was looking into every theory he could think of. He considered Susie hiring a hitman, or Greg's brother Michael, who was also his business partner, but of course, nothing pointed to either of them, and by the end of 2010, Apple was absolutely stuck. But just when it seemed that Greg's case was about to turn cold, Susie decided to reach out to a private investigator who specializes in these types of mysterious cases. Enter Ken Brennan. Ken is a former Long Island cop and DEA special agent, and he only took on cases that he definitely thought he could solve. The next morning, Apple picked up his new BFF, Ken, and they paid a visit to the hotel room. Apple showed Ken the crime scene photos, went over the evidence, and laid out the last seven months of his life that he had devoted to investigating the case. When Apple was finished, Ken said, I think I know how, who, and when it happened. And I think I know how we're gonna catch him. Ken called Susie and asked if her husband was right or left-handed, and she told him right. Then he asked if Greg ever smoked with a cigarette in his left hand, and she said, nope, only his right hand. Ken thanked Susie, then hung up the phone, ready with his theory. With the circuit blowing out at around 8.30 p.m., he believed that this was also around the time Greg expired because the AC was shut off. He said that within a few minutes, the room would have grown hot enough for Greg to have realized it had shut off and turned it back on. He thought Greg was already lifeless before he even had time to realize the AC was still off. With the burnt cigarette in Greg's left hand, he didn't think that Greg had been attacked somewhere else and then placed back in the room. He said it was just too specific for an attacker to place him back in the room and then put a lit cigarette in Greg's hand. Ken thought that Greg lit the cigarette himself and got up from the bed when he suddenly keeled over. Ken said that it made the most sense for it to have been in Greg's right hand, but he was about to open the door, so he switched it to his left so he could grab the doorknob with his right. He knew that Greg wasn't attacked in the room, but he definitely expired in there, and pretty quickly at that. So how? Ken wasn't exactly sure how, but he knew for certain that Greg was just minding his own business when he just suddenly passed, which made him suspect the electricians next door. Apple told Ken he had already looked into them and said they were happy to help out so they didn't seem suspicious. But Ken pointed out that it had been seven months, and if the men were as fond of drinking and gabbing with their buddies as the hotel staff said they were, someone had to know something. All of the electricians they questioned were certainly aware of the story, even if they hadn't been at the hotel at the time. A lot were still curious about it and asked if they've managed to solve it yet. But as Ken was driving home with Apple that day, it suddenly hit him. So Ken was like, go back to the hotel. And Apple was like, what, why? And Ken was like, we're looking for a bullet. Oh snap, a bullet. It all makes sense. Wait, does it? They got back to the room and immediately started looking everywhere. 
They searched the floors, the furniture, the walls, everything. And just as the men were about to call it quits, Ken noticed an indentation on the wall of the room next door. It looked like the end end should have been right where the handle of a door would hit when it was opened. But when they opened it, it didn't match up. It also looked like the end end had been patched over. So when the duo went to the other room, the one where the electricians had been staying, there it was, clear as day. A perfectly neat hole lined up with the smaller one on the other side. And it looked like someone tried to patch it up with toothpaste. When the two men went to the medical examiner, he refused to believe them. He insisted that Greg was beaten and that he didn't find a bullet anywhere. And besides, he couldn't exhume the body because Greg was already in an urn. The two detectives looked over the autopsy photos and every injury that pointed out to the examiner that could have been a bullet, he would reply with, yeah, it could also look like that from a beating. But when Ken and Apple got through the photo of Greg's heart and it clearly had a hole in it, the examiner agreed that it was a bullet hole. And now it was time for the duo to find out from the electricians what really went down that night. After some pressure from the detectives, the men finally broke and told them everything. So next door to Greg's room in room 349, three electricians were boozing it up after a long day of work. The three electricians are Tim, Trent, and Lance. According to both Tim and Trent, Lance got super wasted and Lance asked Trent to go get another bottle from his car and also his nine millimeter Ruger. Trent did, and the group said Lance started playing around with the firearm and jokingly pointed it at Tim. Tim immediately dropped to the ground and was like, dude, But when he pointed it at the foot of the bed where Trent was, it accidentally went off. Immediately, Lance panicked, bundled up the weapon, and ran back down to his car to hide it. Tim, Trent, and Lance all agreed that day to stick to the same story, to play dumb and hope it never came back to them. With the truth finally off of Tim and Trent's chest, Tim agreed to call Lance while the detectives listened to see if he could get him to spill. Tim called up Lance and filled him in on everything, including the part about him spilling the tea to the detectives. After a long moment of silence, Lance was just like, about the Ruger going off? Because he didn't just tell someone about his mistake or even check to see if the person in the room was all right. Lance was trying to hide his connection to the case and that was going to make him look even worse when it came time for his trial. And that's why you always tell the truth. If he had said something or tried to get help, he might not have gotten any jail time at all. Lance was sentenced to 10 years in jail for accidentally firing around into Greg. When the verdict was read, Susie couldn't help but smile. She told Lance that he'd met his match because she would have spent the rest of her life trying to track down whoever it was that took her husband from her. 